بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Last week we spoke about the war between Bani Israel under the leadership of their king Palut against a group of people that were known as the Amaliq. And the Amaliq, they had taken over the lands in Palestine. They had taken over Al-Quds and other areas. And Bani Israel lived under their oppression for many years. So Palut as the king he organized an army from Bani Israel and they went and they fought against those Amaliq to reclaim those lands. And the head of the Amaliq was a huge man named Jalut. And when the time for the battle came, as we mentioned, before the actual fighting between the armies would start, there would be some one-on-one -on -one duels. So Jalut came out from the side of the Amaliq and he said, who from amongst Bani Israel will come and face me in a duel? So this is a big, huge guy. So the people from the army of Bani Israel, they don't want to face him except for one young kid in that army. And that kid, his name was Dawood. At that time, he was only 16 years old. He said, I volunteer. Palut, who was the king of Bani Israel, he didn't want Dawood to go because he thought he's too young, he's too small. But no one else volunteered. So Talut, in order to encourage someone to volunteer, he said, whoever volunteers to fight against Jalut in a duel, and if he is victorious against Jalut, I promise him two things. I will marry my daughter to him and... After I die, he will become the king of Bani Israel. So even after this encouragement, still nobody wanted to face Jalut, except Dawood. He said, I will do it. So after Palut saw that no one else was volunteering to fight against Jalut, and the only one who was volunteering was Dawood, finally he gave Dawood permission to go and fight. And Alhamdulillah, Dawood, he was victorious against Jalut. He shot him with his slingshot, hit him in his forehead, and Jalut dropped dead. So the head of the army of the Amaliq, the commander of the Amaliq, he died before the war actually even started. So when their commander died, the rest of them ran away. Bani Israel was able to chase after them and defeat them. Walhamdulillah. So now, Bani Israel, they have taken back these lands, they have taken Al-Quds, they have taken Jerusalem. And Palut as the king, he was able to unify Bani Israel. So now Palut is the king and Bani Israel, they are unified under the rule of Palut. So this unification, it lasted until Palut died. When Palut died, Rightfully, the kingship was supposed to go to the one who killed Jalut. And that was Dawood alayhi salam. This was the promise of Talut. So after Talut died, Dawood alayhi salam was rightfully the king. But the son of Talut also wanted to be the king. So there was division. After Talut died, there was division amongst Bani Israel. Some of them accepted Dawood as their king because that was the instruction of Talut. And others said, no, the kingship, it should go to the son of Talut. So there was a division and there actually became two kingdoms at that time, two separate kingdoms. So there was division. Dawood alayhi salam, his capital was Khalil. And as for the son of Talut, his capital was Jerusalem. So now two separate kingdoms and division amongst Bani Israel. So this happened approximately the year 1004 before Isa alayhi salam. The year 1004 before Isa alayhi salam. So now Dawood alayhi salam, he has his kingdom. 
But Bani Israel is not unified under him. There are two kingdoms. So within the next few years, Dawood alayhi salam was able to stabilize and strengthen his rule upon his kingdom. And then he made it his goal to once again reunify Bani Israel. And the only way to do that was he would have to go and fight against the son of Talut and take Jerusalem from him. So if Dawood alayhi salam can do this successfully, if he can defeat the son of Talut and take Jerusalem, then once again Bani Israel would be unified together again under one king. So in the year 995 before Isa alayhi salam, Dawood alayhi salam and his army set out to conquer Al-Quds from the son of Talut and to reunify the kingdom of Bani Israel. To make it one kingdom instead of two separate kingdoms. So he fought against the son of Talut and Dawood alayhi salam and his army, alhamdulillah, they were victorious. They were victorious. They took over Jerusalem. They defeated the son of Talut. And then Dawood alayhi salam became the unanimous king of Bani Israel. Now he was the undisputed king of Bani Israel. So they were unified once again, alhamdulillah. And Dawood alayhi salam, he established Jerusalem as the capital of the kingdom. And alhamdulillah, he was able to conquer other cities to the north as well. And he reached as far as Damascus in Syria. And he conquered Damascus and Damascus actually became part of the kingdom of Dawood alayhi salam as well. And Dawood alayhi salam, he was a king and he was also a prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with prophethood as well. And he was given revelation as well. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتَيْنَا دَاوُودَ زَبُورًا And we gave Dawood the Zabur. So he was a king, he was a prophet, he had a beautiful voice. He would recite and he would remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with such a beautiful voice that the mountains would participate with him and the birds would participate with him. Right? So he had this beautiful, beautiful voice. Once the companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu was reciting Quran and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard his recitation. He had a really beautiful recitation, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listened to his recitation and then he said to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, لَقَدْ أُوْتِيْتَ مِزْمَارًا مِنْ مَزَامِيرْ آلِ دَاوُودِ That you have been given a beautiful voice that is from the legacy of uh, Dawood alayhi salam and his family. So he compared the voice of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari to the voice of Dawood alayhi salam. Right? So Dawood alayhi salam had a beautiful voice. He was a king. He was a prophet. He used to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was given revelation. He was given the zabur. Right? And he ruled Bani Israel with justice. He's a prophet of Allah. Of course, he's going to rule in the right way with justice. Dawood alayhi salam remained the king of Bani Israel until his death. He died in the year 963 before Isa alayhi salam. And after he died, his son Sulaiman alayhi salam took over as the king of Bani Israel. And Sulaiman alayhi salam was a king and he was also a prophet as well, like his father. Dawood alayhi salam was a king and a prophet. Sulaiman alayhi salam was also a king and a prophet. But as for Sulaiman alayhi salam and his kingdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Sulaiman alayhi salam a kingdom unlike anyone else in history. No one before Sulaiman alayhi salam had a kingdom like Sulaiman alayhi salam and no one after Sulaiman alayhi salam had a kingdom like Sulaiman alayhi salam. Sulaiman alayhi salam by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he had the ability to communicate with animals and he had he had the ability to communicate with jinns and he had jinns uh, in his army as well he had the ability to communicate with birds and he would command the birds to do whatever he wanted them to do he even had control of the wind by the permission of allah he would tell the wind which direction to take him and the wind would 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 take him wherever he wanted to go subhanallah Right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave Sulaiman alayhi salam such a kingdom that he had power over all of these things. Yeah, he was able to, to use the animals, 
the jinns, the birds, the wind, in any way that he saw fit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this power, right? So he ruled Bani Israel for a number of years with justice as well as a prophet, as a judge, and as a king of Bani Israel. When Sulaiman alayhi salam died, then the kingdom became divided again. So it was unified during the period of Dawood alayhi salam and his son Sulaiman alayhi salam. So that unified kingdom of Bani Israel, it lasted for approximately 90 years. The unification of Bani Israel as one kingdom under Dawood alayhi salam and then Sulaiman alayhi salam, that unification lasted for a period of approximately 90 years. But then after Sulaiman alayhi salam died, it was split into two kingdoms once again. The northern kingdom, which was known as the kingdom of Israel, and the capital of that kingdom was Nablus. And that was ruled by one of the sons of Sulaiman alayhi salam. And then there was the southern kingdom, and that was known as the kingdom of Yehuda. The kingdom of Yehuda. And the capital of that kingdom was Jerusalem, was Al-Quds. And that was actually ruled by another one of the sons of Sulaiman alayhi salam. So once again, there was a division in the kingdom, two separate kingdoms, each one ruled by a different son of Sulaiman alayhi salam. Now, during the period of the unified kingdom, during the time of Dawood alayhi salam and Sulaiman alayhi salam, the Jews claim, one of their claims is that there was a great temple that was built. They say that Dawood alayhi salam, he laid the foundations for that temple, but then he died. And then when Sulaiman alayhi salam became the king, he actually built that temple. And that temple, they refer to it as Haikal Sulaiman, the temple of Sulaiman. And according to the Jewish narrations, as we mentioned, they say that Dawood alayhi salam laid the foundations for that. And then Sulaiman alayhi salam built it. And they say that it was actually built on the Mount Muria, and that is actually the place where Al Masjid Al Aqsa is situated right now. The Jews they claim that Sulaiman alayhi salam had built a temple on that spot, and they say that this temple that Sulaiman alayhi salam built, which they call Haikal Sulaiman, they say that it was a magnificent temple. They say it was you know made out of so much gold. And, you know, if, if, if the way that it's described, it's something unlike anything that any person has actually ever seen before, the way that they describe it, right? Like, unlike any other building in history. They say it was a magnificent and a glorious temple. And they say that Sulaiman alayhi salam ordered that the tabut, remember that, that wooden box that we spoke about last week, that Bani Israel had in their possession that had some of the remnants from the time of Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam, there's some of the clothes of Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam, the stick of Musa alayhi salam, some of the remaining tablets of the Torah that were given to Musa alayhi salam and were kept in that tabut, in that box. So the Jews say that Sulaiman alayhi salam, he built this temple and then he ordered that the tabut be kept inside that temple. And they say that this temple was established by Sulaiman alayhi salam as a house of worship where Bani Israel can come to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, they say, according to, to the Jewish narrations, they say that the construction of this temple took seven years and they say that more than 180,000 men took part in its construction. And they claim that when the construction of the temple was completed and it was the, you know, when it was set to be open, you know, the grand opening of the temple, they say that Sulaiman alayhi salam ordered that more than 20,000 cows to be sacrificed and more than 100,000 sheep to be sacrificed on that day. This is what they claim. Then they claim that eventually the temple was destroyed by Bukhtu Nasr, the Babylonian ruler who invaded Jerusalem and uh, basically took the Jews of Jerusalem as captives and took them back to Babylon. That happened in the year 586 before Isa alayhi salam. So they say 
Bukhtu Nasr came into Jerusalem, he completely obliterated the city. He completely destroyed the city and he dis destroyed and dismantled the temple and he took the pieces, you know, the dismantled pieces of the, of the temple to Babylon. So these are some of the claims that the Jews make regarding Haikal Suleiman, the temple that they claim was built by Suleiman alayhi salam. But in reality, if you look at it, in reality, there is no authentic source which proves that Suleiman alayhi salam built this temple. And there is no proof of the existence of this temple at all. There is no proof that such a temple actually ever existed. The only source is the corrupted narrations of the Jews themselves. So if a person looks at it from a historical perspective, then they will realize that, you know, Haikal Suleiman, it's nothing more than a myth. It's nothing more than a myth. And in fact, in reality, it never existed. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence that actually indicates that we cannot attribute the building of a temple like this to Suleiman alayhi salam. There's a lot of evidence regarding this. And one of the pieces of evidence is that this temple is not mentioned anywhere. The Haikal Suleiman is not mentioned in any, any historical source. The only place where it is mentioned is in the books of the Jews. And we know that those scriptures have been corrupted by the Jews over time. Right? Even Jewish scholars themselves and, and historians, they admit that the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians, the scriptures of the Ahlul Kitab have been subjected to distortion. Right? They have been tampered with. Things have been added to them. Other things have been taken out from them. Right? So they cannot be trusted uh, to be a reliable source. Right? And these nar narrations of the Jews regarding the Haikal, they don't have any chain of narration that goes back to any prophet. Right? So the, the sources are not trustworthy. Also, if you look at the narrations in the Old Testament that mention the Haikal Suleiman, if you look at the Old Testament and you see the verses that mention the Haikal Suleiman, the Temple of Suleiman, there are contradictions within these verses. Different verses that mention the Temple, they contradict each other. So with these contradictions, you know that this is something that cannot be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, in one of the verses, in one of the books of the Old Testament which mentions Haikal Suleiman, they say that the, those who were supervising the workers who were building the temple, the ones who were in charge of the supervision, they were 3,300 men in charge of the supervision of the building of the temple. But then if you look elsewhere in the Old Testament, there's a contradiction. There is another verse which mentions that the number of people who were supervising the construction was 3,600 men. So one verse says 3,300. Another one says... 3,600. So this is a contradiction. There are other contradictions as well, right? So, you know, this is, is proof that these narrations cannot be trusted. Also, if you look at the way that the temple is described in, you know, these, these Jewish narrations, you will see that the, the, the description of the temple itself, it doesn't even make sense. It's, it's something, the, the way that the temple is described is, is more like a figment of someone's imagination, the way that they describe this structure. It's not like any building that has ever been built in history, the way that they describe it. For example, they say that to build this Haikal, to build the temple of Suleiman, they say 100,000 wazna of gold was used. Wazna, it is a it is a measurement that is equivalent to approximately 16 grams. So if they say 100,000 wazna was used to build the Haikal of Suleiman, the amount of gold that is, that's, that's over 1.6 tons of gold. 1.6 tons of gold to build the Haikal Suleiman. This is something that doesn't logically even make sense. And they say the same amount of silver was used as well. So 1.6 tons of gold and 1.6 tons of silver, right? And they say that the amount of workers that took place, that, that took part in the construction of the temple, there were 180,000 workers. And they said out of those 180,000 workers, Suleiman sent 30,000 of them to Lebanon 
to cut down trees to bring them to assist in the construction, right? And they said that the, the supervisors of the construction, in one verse it mentions 3,300, another verse it mentions 3,600, right? So look at this, the way that they describe it, with all this gold and all this silver and 30,000 trees had to be sent in from Lebanon and 180,000 workers worked on it and it took seven years to construct, right? So can you imagine what type of, of building that would be? But then in the end, when they describe, if you look at the verses in the Old Testament which describe the size of the temple, they said it was 60 cubits long. That's about 100 feet long. And 20 cubits wide. That's about 30 feet wide. And 30 cubits high. And that's about 45 feet high. And they say the porch or the courtyard that it had in the front, it was 20 cubits long. That's about 30 feet long and 10 cubits wide, which is about 15 feet wide. So this is the size that they describe. So in other words, they say that the area of the temple, they say 100 feet by 30 feet approximately, so about 3,000 square feet uh, with a height of maybe four stories or five stories. So that's not so huge if you think about it. 3,000 square feet, you know, four or five floors. But the way that they describe 180,000 men to construct it in seven years with 1.6 tons of gold and 1.6 tons of silver, all of that and 30,000 trees from Lebanon, all of that to make a building that's only 3,000 square feet and only about four or five stories long, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up, right? So even from their own narrations, you can see that the stories don't add up and they don't make sense. So you can see that there is a lot of exaggeration <coughs> in what they have described and the reality is that this is just a myth and there is no evidence at all that this structure even existed at all. Also, from the evidence that this structure never even existed is that the Jews themselves have not agreed with each other on the location, right? There are Jews the Jews from the kingdom of Israel, you know, one of those divided kingdoms, they say that the temple was in the city of Nablus. And then others have said, no, it was in the village of Beitin. And then some of them said that it was in Jerusalem. Some of them said it was on Tal al-Qadi, the, the mound or the mount of the judge named Dan, right? So even the Jews amongst themselves they have different narrations regarding where the location of Haikal Suleiman was. So they're not all agreed that was actually even in Jerusalem. They're not even all actually agreed that was in Jerusalem. So there is difference of opinion amongst the Jews regarding the location as well. And the reality is that there is no evidence in any of these places of a structure ever being there. There are no remnants of it at all. So, you know, with all of this evidence, it is, it, is, it, is, it is easy to see that the whole idea of Haikal Suleiman, the Temple of Suleiman, it is something that never existed in reality. What is the actual reality? What did Suleiman actually build? He actually rebuilt Al Masjid Al Aqsa. That is what he built. Right? Who originally built Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? There's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he was asked by Abu Dhar Al-Ghifari radiallahu an, which masjid was built first? Which masjid was placed upon this earth first? And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Then Abu Dhar asked Thumma ay. Then after that, which is the next masjid? And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And then Abu Dhar asked, and how many years be between them? And the Prophet ﷺ said 40 years. So the ulama have mentioned that the Kaaba was first originally built by Adam salam, And then over, over time it was destroyed and it was rebuilt by Ibrahim salam. And the ulama have also said that Adam salam first he built the Kaaba, then 40 years later he actually built Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa as well. Adam salam built it 40 years later. And then that was also destroyed as well. And it was rebuilt. Masjid al-Aqsa was rebuilt either by Ibrahim alayhi salam when he migrated to Palestine. It was either rebuilt by Ibrahim alayhi salam or it may have been rebuilt by the grandson 
of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ya'qub alayhi salam. So either Ibrahim alayhi salam or Ya'qub alayhi salam rebuilt Al Masjid Al Aqsa, and then Sulaiman alayhi salam, years later, many years later, Sulaiman alayhi salam, he, he renovated Al Masjid Al Aqsa and he, 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 he fixed the parts that needed fixing and he expanded it as it needed to be expanded. So Sulaiman alayhi salam, he did not build a separate structure, he did not build uh, the temple of Sulaiman as they claim. Rather, what he did was he uh, renovated and he repaired and he expanded Al Masjid Al Aqsa. As for those who say that the Haikal of Sulaiman is upon the place where Al Masjid Al Aqsa is on today, this is absolutely false. And the proof for that is that Al Masjid Al Aqsa existed before Sulaiman. It existed before Sulaiman alayhi salam. So if Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa already existed before Sulaiman alayhi salam, how could Sulaiman alayhi salam build, build the temple upon the place where Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa already was? Would he tear down Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and build a temple there? No, absolutely not. Masjid Al-Aqsa existed before Sulaiman alayhi salam. So the whole concept, you can see from all of this proof, the whole concept of Haikal Sulaiman and the Temple of Sulaiman, it is something that really has no basis in reality. And Sulaiman alayhi salam, actually what he did in Jerusalem is that he rebuilt and he refurbished and he renovated Al Masjid Al Aqsa. He renovated Al Masjid Al Aqsa. This is the reality of what Sulaiman alayhi salam built during his kingship in Jerusalem. So, inshallah, we'll stop there for today, bi'idhnillah, and inshallah next week. We will continue with the history of the Holy Land by Idnillah. Jazakumullah khair wa barakallahu fikum wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.